On January 5th, the coast of California cringed under the brunt of a raging Force 5 gale. Hardly the scenario for one of the greatest surfing adventures of all time. Well, that swell was just, every indication was no chance for anywhere. About noon the day before, all the forecast changed. And Mike and I literally called each other at the same time going, hey, have you seen the new you know, wind forecast out there? I called him at about 3 o'clock, and I said, are you looking at this? And he went, I can't believe you just called me. I'm looking at the exact same thing. It looks like the wind's going to die at Cortez. Located in international waters over 100 miles off the coast of Southern California, Cortez Bank is actually the tip of a giant submarine seamount that rises to a few fathoms from the ocean's surface. In 2001, Mike Parsons, Brad Gerlach, were part of the pioneering team who first rode the massive waves focusing on the offshore bank, including one giant that earned Parsons the XXL Biggest Wave Award that year. But given the conditions on January 5th, an attempt to reach Cortez Bank would have been considered almost suicidal. To cut the odds, Parsons put in a call to the world's premier surf forecaster, Surfline's Sean Collins. So I explained to Mike, I said, listen, you know, dude, the, the, models, the models are off at all. You know, if they're off by a couple of hours, we're screwed. And, you know, if that's what you want to go for, then great, go for it. Me, personally, I would say it's a little too risky. I actually suggested that they didn't go. The reality of pulling it off, I mean, when you put the numbers down on paper, was slim to none. Their next call was to veteran skipper and photographer Rob Brown. My phone keeps ringing, and it's uh, Greg Long, and then it's Mike Parsons, and I was trying not to talk to them because I know they want to go surf. You know, these guys are surfers. And they get so excited, so hyped up. And that's where we just went, we have to try. We got to be there. Worst case scenario, we look at it, we get seasick, and, and we just destroy ourselves, but we have to go look. So I just thought, wow, we're going out there. It's, <laughs> it's probably not going to be small. But I'm also, I also get seasick, so I was just like, oh, great, you know? The 100-mile crossing proved to be a major ordeal especially as someone had to pilot one of the skis the entire distance behind the boat. It wasn't like airing over wind shops. These were eight-foot moles that I'm going in and out of and airing off and plowing into the next one. Maybe five and a half hours of, of constant pounding. But it's five hours of uh, uh, boom, uh, 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 yeah, 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 uh, boom, you know, just really wears you down. Yeah, you know, I, I never get seasick, and by the time I made it out there at that trip, I was, I was pretty close to you know, losing it. It was a Mr. Toad's wild ride, to say the least. After a six-hour battering, the team, which also included South Africa's Grant Twiggy Baker, crossed into international waters. As soon as we got within about five miles of the bank, you know, that's when you can see the first waves, and you just see these giant plumes of white water exploding, and that's when it's just like you're born again, you know, it didn't matter what you just went through, now it's time to go surf, let's, let's go do this. It was straight away obvious that this was the biggest waves we'd ever seen in our entire lives. Our mood kind of went from we were so excited just thinking we're going to score, it's going to be all time, to oh my god, are we really, can we ride these ways? With a seriously seasick cameraman able to shoot only a few sketchy images, Rob Brown had to snap his own still photos while steering around giant rogue set waves. Later on, some waves came in that if I had done something foolish, we wouldn't have been here anymore. And those guys would have had to walk home. <laughs> we were all kind of looking at each other like, you know, this is, this is a serious deal right now. We just talked about stuff like in a, in a mountain climbing way. You know, we we're like, hey, no wipeouts. Up until this time, Mike Parsons 2001 double XL winning wave had yet to be topped. But this day, the swell jumped to a whole different level. Yeah, it was uh, a little while into the session. I had, we had probably been surfing about uh, a little over an hour. I just remember being on the outside, and uh, a huge set was coming. 
I had towed Twiggy into an absolutely huge wave. I think it was the third wave of this um, set. And I remember going over the back of it and looking behind me. And there's Mike and Brad towing into the biggest wave I've ever seen in my entire life. Before I ever took it, it was just way obvious. Like, this is the biggest wave I've ever seen. I remember looking down. and he, he was so far down there. It's just the craziest feeling of looking and just going, man, that's a big one. He was this tiny ant on a giant mound of dirt. And he wasn't going down. I remember watching him. He was getting sucked up the face. I started to slow down and lift a little bit. And I was just praying to God that it wouldn't, wouldn't stay that way. Making a wave that big where you, you realize, OK, I've pulled it. You know, I, I, I'm going to be sweet. That moment right there is the ultimate feeling in surfing. Brad just kind of pulls up, and I just look at him, just going, "That was, that was, biggest wave I've ever ridden." With three double XL big wave awards between them, the Cortez crew certainly have the credibility to make this call. But only the double XL judges would reveal how this wave would stack up against Vincent Lardazen's Belhara Giant for the Honda Biggest Wave Award. In a year full of double XL surprises, the biggest of all was saved for last. The Billabong Double XL Global Big Wave Awards are presented by Monster Energy. Unleash the Beast.